everyone, assalamu alaikum, um, and welcome to a very special event. Uh, we are speaking to uh, two distinguished uh, guests, speakers, and intellectuals, and we are taking on a very important and quite urgent topic, that is solidarity between the two nations, that of Palestine and Kashmir. A conversation on Kashmir and Palestine and the struggle for freedom. We have with us His Excellency Masoud Khan, President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. We also have Professor Dr. Samuel Aryan, Director of the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. We're going to be hearing from both of them and we will give you the chance to present your questions and feedback. But first, let me pass the uh, mic to my colleague, Dr. Farhan Chak, Secretary General of Kashmir Civitas. Dr. Chak, can you please unmute your mic? Thank you very much, gentlemen. I apologize for that. And uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests, His Excellency President Masood Khan and uh, Professor Sami al Ariana, a leader and an icon in the Muslim community uh, for so long. Um, I myself am chairing an organization working with a fantastic group of people raising awareness on Kashmir globally. And we together thought of conceding the such important issues for the Muslim world, both Palestine and Kashmir. And I'd like to first take uh, an introduction for His Excellency President Masood Khan, really who whose illustrious career is in many ways unrivaled. If you look at all of his achievements, they put anybody to shame. And not only that, a man of impeccable integrity. Uh, he was a Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations. He was chairing several committees in Geneva and in New York, illustrious, including the Group of 77. And now he is the 27th president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, a great responsibility that he is working tirelessly, tirelessly for. So now I would like to hand it over to His Excellency, President Masood Khan. Your Excellency. Thank you so much. Uh, this is my first opportunity to congratulate you face to face on the launch of Kashmir Civitas. So heartiest congratulations. You've asked me to speak for uh, five to six minutes and uh, I'll focus on Kashmir. Uh, let me tell you that there are six or seven points that I want to highlight very quickly. First is that um, yesterday, India introduced the application or implementation of the new domicile rules, which means that outsiders, non-natives from all over India can settle in Kashmir. Now. Uh, you know, even before the occupation of the Jammu and Kashmir territory in 1947, Kashmiris had some uh, recognized rights, right to property, right to permanent residence, right to education, and right to seats in educational institutions. All those have been taken away, and now they have been open to Hindus from all over India. So this is the first thing that has started yesterday. Um, in fact, they're going to import uh, about 2 million people, and they have put the entire process on a fast track. Uh, they are asking officials to um, uh, issue these domicile certificates to anybody who has served in the occupied territory for the last 15 years or the f for 15 years. It, it doesn't have to be the last 15 years. Second, anybody who studied there for seven years or who has uh, passed the, or appeared in the 10th and 12th class examinations. Migrant workers, uh, also these uh, Hindu refugees there, 
anybody who has served in the um, civil service or in the uh, statutory uh, bodies, including banks and universities, they can be settled there. And there would be special privileges for the party members of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, this violent extremist organization which is ruling India right now. The objective is to change the demographic composition of the occupied territory under duress without the consent of the people because the territory right now is under siege. Um, it is under a triple lockdown. The first lockdown started in 1989, as a matter of fact. Then the second lockdown started last year in August on August the 5th, and uh, the latest is COVID-19 lockdown. Now, India has uh, uh, tried to introduce this draconian measure called the domicile rules under the cover of COVID-19. And under the same cover, it has started killing young men all over Kashmir. Um, in the past uh, months, they have killed about uh, 73 young men the number must be higher, the real number must be higher. And uh, they go to these villages, blast houses, terrorize population, vandalize people. Um, when there are demonstrations, despite all these restrictions, there are demonstrations because when they kill young men, they are not handing over these occupation authorities, are not handing over the bodies, dead bodies to their families. There is reaction. And uh, when there's that reaction, there are demonstrations and these occupation forces are firing uh, uh, at these demonstrators using uh, pellet firing shotguns, automatic weapons, um, and uh, uh, many other lethal weapons. So uh, they are blinding people, they're killing people, they are hounding them, they're hunting them down. That's the kind of atmosphere that prevails in the Indian occupied territory today. Second is that they have um, escalated the situation along the line of control. Uh, you know, the line of control, which is the ceasefire line between Azad Kashmir and the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And um, they, are, they are targeting on our side, Azad Kashmir, they're targeting civilians, they're killing civilians and they are destroying infrastructure and they're using heavy weaponry, including artillery and high caliber mortar and automatic weapons. And uh, they know that when Pakistani armed forces fire back uh, or retaliate, they do not target civilians. They only engage military posts. So what they have done, these people, they have moved these uh, their own posts to the villages, to the thickly uh, densely populated villages so that they can use uh, villages as human shields. And um, lastly, I would say, you know, the situation has become very dire because Indians are telling lies. Like they are saying that uh, we are sending militants across the line of control. It's not true. That uh, the people, the indigenous resistance that you have there inside Kashmir uh, is backed by Pakistan, which is not true. Uh, the total number that their police chief tells uh, is resisting the 900,000 occupation forces is 240, 240 young boys uh, who are resisting indigenously the um, uh, occupation forces. Now, you can see that this is this 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 is the uh, highest imaginable asymmetry between the two forces: 240 versus uh, 900,000, and. Uh, then uh, the Indian political leadership and their military commanders have been indulging in war mongering. Uh, they are creating a situation of war psychosis. Or what they are saying is that they would attack Azad Kashmir, they would attack Gilgit Baltistan, and uh, they want to. Why are they doing that? I mean, I call it uh, a fog of lies. Uh, why are they crafting these uh, false, fabricated stories? One is to divert attention, uh, attention of the rest of the world, and the attention is, in any case is diverted because everybody is preoccupied with the pandemic, the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And the second objective is to prepare for a false flag operation. They might do some 
um, mischief inside the occupied territory or across the line of control and then blame Pakistan and create a justification for, for an act of aggression. We are prepared, but let me tell you that um, in the occupied territory right now, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing and war crimes are being committed with impunity, without any accountability. And uh, the response from the international community has been muted, with the exception of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which has issued uh, one or two statements mm -hmm. condemning the introduction of these domicile laws. But I think that the United Nations Security Council, the United Nations Secretary General, the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, other multilateral forums, other parliaments in the world, which in the past used to be very vocal about Kashmir, particularly last year, they are all silent because of COVID-19. And India is taking advantage of this space, this opportunity to further brutalize the people of Jammu and Kashmir and colonize them. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. What a beautifully articulated sentiment and one that is very dire. The situation is extremely dire, as you mentioned, particularly the threat of a false flag operation. And now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Professor Ramzi. Tafadda. Professor Ramsey, uh, you could unmute your microphone kindly. Yes, sorry about that. Uh, just very quickly, I want to say before I introduce uh, Professor Alarian, it's just incredible the degree of similarity between the Kashmiri and the Palestinian case, not just with the, the brutal tactics used by the Indian uh, occupiers in Kashmir, uh, but also the silence of the international community to all of these crimes over the years, and also the steadfastness and the resistance of the Kashmiri people. Uh, now I will be introducing uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Professor Samuel Aryan. He is the director of the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, SIGA, and public affairs professor at <coughs> Istanbul. Zaim University. Uh, Professor Alarian is very well known, uh, especially here in the United States where he uh, worked and lived for many years. He founded numerous institutions and publications in the fields of education, research, religion, and interfaith. I can go on and on about him. Just want to say just a little snippet just to give you an idea of the degree uh, of, of uh, um, uh, prestige and, and, and leadership he has here. In 2001, he was named by Newsweek as the premier civil rights activists, activist in the U.S. for his efforts to repel the use of secret evidence in immigration courts. Uh, Professor Alaria. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramsey, for your generous and kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Shaq, for, for moderating this. And thank you so much, Mr. President, for, uh, for being part of this important uh, seminar. Kashmir and Palestine are the two struggles that I believe are so similar, as, as Ramsey said, in so many ways. Both were born out of British imperialism. <coughs> Britain occupied Palestine between 1918 and 1948, and it also was occupying India. And both of these struggles came out of that tradition of British colonialism and imperialism. Both nations were promised self-determination by the United Nations, a promise that were uh, promises that were never fulfilled. Both nations have a population of approximately uh, similar numbers, 13 to 15 uh, million. Both nations struggle for freedom and self-determination now for over 70 years. Both nations struggle against military occupations of the indigenous people. Both nations have to struggle against racist and xenophobic enemies determined to occupy the land and rule over the population by military power and brutal means. Both occupations try to de depopulate the lands of their indigenous populations and use settler colonialist means to change the demographics. Israel has been doing this since its foundation with the acceleration 
that has been taking place in the in the West Bank after the Oslo Accords of 1993. And recently, India is trying to emulate the Israeli tactics in order to change the demographics of Kashmir. Both populations, both nations, had to struggle against wars for years. In the case of the Palestinian and the greater Arab world, they had to face wars mostly initiated by Israel in 1948, 56, 67, 73, 82, 2006, 2008 and 9, 2012, 2014, and on and on and on, and now with the crippling siege of Gaza and the brutal occupation in the West Bank. Similarly, the people of Kashmir had to endure brutal occupations and wars <coughs> particularly in 65 and 71, and the crackdown, as the president said, since 1989. Both nations have to resort to peaceful and uh, uprisings. In the case of the Palestinians in 87 through 91, in the case of the Kashmiris, who emulated actually the Palestinian tactics back in 88 and 89. Both nations have an increasing rate of poverty, unemployment, and a miserable life. <coughs> Both of their occupiers use extrajudicial means and horrific crackdowns on these populations in order to break their will to resist. Both nations have to endure thousands upon thousands of prisoners, including women and children. For half a century, Israel has arrested in the upward of three quarters of a million people. 750,000 Palestinians had to pass through Israeli prisons, including women and children. Today, we have about 5,000 prisoners, including 200 children under the age of 17, and about 50 women. In the case of Kashmir, for the past 20 years, at least 20,000 people have been arrested or jailed. <clears throat> Both nations have to live under occupation, not for a year, not for 10 years, but over <coughs> decades in a state of siege without <coughs> any kind of relief from the so-called international community. Both of their occupiers maintain an occupation army of over 700,000 in the case of Kashmir and over 150,000 in the case of the West Bank and Palestine with an army, Israeli army, that is in the upward of 650,000 ready at a moment's notice to brutalize the Palestinians and the people. Both nations, India and Israel, are cooperating, increasingly cooperati cooperating in order to uh, coordinate their occupational tactics against their victims. They cooperate in weapons and tactics. They have been warming the relations, particularly with the prime minister of each country. Both are hostile to the indigenous faith of these two populations, particularly to Islam. <coughs> in addition, we will find that we have victims of similar nature, of similar occupation, of similar ideologies. <clears throat> Both are living under siege, as I said, and they will want to break free of this seizure. I want to remind people before I end a quotation by Franz Fanon in his seminal book on Richard of the Earth. He says, each generation must discover its mission fulfill it or betray it. It is our mission, our generation's mission, to make sure that the people of Palestine and the people of Kashmir are no longer living under occupation. I want to paraphrase also Nelson Mandela, who was once asked about Palestinians, and he said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And I say that we know too well that our freedom Everybody's freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians and the Kashmiris. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Samuel Aryan, uh, for this uh, excellent uh, uh, intervention and comments. Uh, now, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Chak, will um, present his first question to His Excellency. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sami, for that fantastic uh, overview and struggle with the and the Kashmiri people. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to His Excellency President Masood Khan. Uh, there's a famous African proverb that if you want to go fast, go, if you want to go far, teamwork is essential towards the actualization of any goal. And just take, for example, the Muslim League, the Ak Party in Turkey, and the profound solidarity that catapulted them must be carefully analyzed instead. But to you, Your Excellency, considering all that, what are some of the challenges in developing this camaraderie, this spirit of solidarity in Kashmir? Thank you so much for this question. Before I respond to this question, I want to compliment uh, Professor Al Aryan over a fantastic collage of what is happening in Palestine and Kashmir. And um, this presentation in such a compressed form could not have been better and could not have been more effective. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Al Aryan, for doing that. Uh, <clears throat> responding to your question, as a matter of fact, I mean, we have many dilemmas that we are facing. The first dilemma is that Kashmir has become bigger than the Kashmiri nationalism or the rights of the Kashmiris. And the Palestinian question also has become bigger than the Palestinian question. It is no more about uh, Palestine, the people of Palestine and people of uh, uh, Kashmir. It is about uh, civilizational fault lines. Um, because, you know, uh, Muslims are being brutalized in Jammu and Kashmir and in Palestine because they are Muslims. And uh, the current world order dominated by Christendom or, or Judaism that discriminates against them. I mean, this is a bitter truth, but it has to be stated um, clearly. And now in that bandwagon, the Hindutva squad, death squads join, as a matter of fact, join in. Uh, these, uh, what is Hindutva? Hindutva is about uh, uh, Hindu supremacy, and it is being driven by uh, Hindu supremacists. So this is one of the dilemmas that we are facing, that these issues, which are about the basic political or fundamental rights of the Kashmiris or Palestinians, now have become um, intermeshed with what you call uh, strategic fault lines and civilizational fault lines. Let me also tell you that uh, 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 right now uh, in the international community there is no rule of law. I mean, we pretend sometimes that there is rule of law, but there is no rule of law. Um, and uh, oh, uh, the United Nations has been sidelined. In fact, the world order that was symbolized by the United Nations is unraveling. And uh, let me also tell you that this, uh, this um, uh, rise of fascism all over the world, either it is fascism or ethnic nationalism or religious supremacy, these are the doctrines which rule the world today. And uh, uh, then, you, then you must see that I'm in, uh, uh, the Israeli state is doing um, to Palestinians what the Nazis did to them um, in the interwar period last century or particularly in the 1930s. Similarly, I mean, taking a leaf from the Israeli playbook, uh, the Indian occupation authorities or the BJP or Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh uh, they are. They have also introduced these so-called Nuremberg laws, where you first reduce the population, a particular population, of to to a minority. You rob them of their identity. You displace them. You create such stress that they are forced to migrate. I mean, uh, the biggest tragedy in this context is, uh, you see that uh, uh, <clears throat> Israelis who came from all over the world and they. Uh, constructed these illegal settlements in the West Bank, and they are ready to annex them. 
but Palestinian refugees are not allowed to come back to their homes. And similarly, in Kashmir, what they're doing is that there are millions of people would be imported and implanted in the uh, Kashmir, uh, uh, in the occupied territory. Now, let me, I have reiterated many times, but I want to say it once again, that these are violations of the for Geneva Convention, Additional Protocol 1, ICC Statute, and also Security Council resolutions. What are they? They are plainly um, violation of uh, international law, international humanitarian law, and they are also war crimes or crimes against humanity. The international law says so. So, but your question is uh, slightly different. How can we... Um, create a community of common interest? Uh, and how can we mobilize those forces? You know, right now, the Muslim world is uh, divided. I mean, there has been some lull during this COVID-19 pandemic period. But otherwise, um, there have been civil wars, there have been uh, internecine regional wars, and therefore, it is very difficult to uh, gather all these Muslim communities on one platform. But we should not lose hope because I see signs of uh, renaissance because this awareness, I've been going to Turkey and I, I was in Malaysia and I've been to many other Muslim countries, even in the Western world. And you can build this coalition. There are these prospects and they can revolve around the issues of Jammu and Kashmir and Palestine. There are three things that I want to say very quickly. One is that uh, the situation in the Jammu and Kashmir territory as it prevails today can trigger a war because India is on a very aggressive course. Uh, and second, uh, there could be a rise in militancy, in armed resistance, because you can't keep uh, 14 million people people under captivity, and particularly 8 million people, 8, 8 million Muslims in the Valley of Kashmir under perpetual uh, captivity. So there would be armed resistance and uh, these, are, these, these expectations that there would be, that the, the, the boys would remain always peaceful. Um, I doubt that. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Fantastic. Brother Ramsey, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. My my uh, question is to uh, Professor Alarian, and I'm I'm going to kind of challenge you a little bit here, Professor. You know, I've heard this many times. I've been asked this question many times by our uh, uh, Kashmiri uh, sisters, brothers, uh, and 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 comrades, who um kind of have this thing for us that we Palestinians are not doing enough to show solidarity with Kashmir the same way that Kashmir and Kashmiris show solidarity with Palestine. And to their credit, I mean, the first martyr that fell outside of Palestine during the 2014 Israeli war on Gaza that killed thousands was a Kashmiri protesting for Palestine. Now, just very quickly, I want to say that I remember growing up in a refugee camp in Gaza where Every Friday, the Imam of the mosque prayed for Kashmir, the same way that he prayed for Afghanistan, Chechnya, and so on. So Kashmir kind of featured as a very important facet of our collective awareness. Um, so I'm surprised when I ask this question. Where do you think the question comes from? And how can Palestinian solidarity for Kashmir become more visible and meaningful? Thank you for this excellent question. And I want to acknowledge at the outset that there is a lot of truth to this and it has a historical reason and that reason is that the, the Palestinian struggle uh, especially in the 50s and 60s and, and, and possibly the 70s was, was couched into Arab nationalism and uh, at the time also India was one of the biggest supporters of the Palestinian cause and there wasn't a lot of knowledge however I would I would challenge that I would push back by saying that uh, uh, many Palestinians, including myself, growing up, we knew about Kashmir and we always supported Kashmir. And I can give you two examples. 
I established two organizations in the United States during my presence there uh, on Palestine. One was in 1981 called the Islamic Association for Palestine. And I invited, and this was primarily uh, uh, attended by Palestinians, uh, I invited the person to give the keynote speech for that conference was from Kashmir. And it was, the, the slogan was that Palestine is the Kashmir of the subcontinent and Kashmir is the Palestine of the Arab world. So we tied from, I'm talking about 81, we tied this struggle very early on. Also in 1988, I established another organization called the Islamic Committee for Palestine. And every year we would pick one of these struggles in order to focus on it. And in 1990, our focus was on Kashmir. And keep in mind, this is the year where the whole world was uh, occupied by the occupation, Iraqi occupation of Kuwait. Yet we raised that issue because the, the Intifada in Kashmir was also raised, uh, raising at the time. So when we talk about historically, you know, how Palestinians look at Kashmir, uh, this is the same way as Kashmiris look at Palestine. I said at the heart of every Palestinian is the struggle for freedom. And now no one can deny what the Kashmiris are going through and their struggle for freedom. So there is very much linkage there between the two struggles. And spe spe especially today, there is no excuse for the nationalists even <coughs> not to uh, look at what India is doing, not only against Kashmiris in Jammu and Kashmir, but also its close cooperation with, the, with, with, the, with, the, with Israel. Uh, today, we cannot distinguish between the ideology of political Zionism, extreme Zionism, that is, is, is uh, uh, it's, it, the core of its ideology is to empty the land, depopulate the land, and occupy the land and depopulate its, its people from the uh, BJP and, uh, and the RSS and others uh, using similar language, similar tactics, and also uh, complete cooperation. So I would say now we come to the point where we need to, to, to coordinate, cooperate, and, uh, and, and establish solidarity movements. Part of the problem, or so this is my last point, is the relative weakness that people uh, feel. And what we have to do is to empower ourselves. And you empower yourself by, 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 by being on the right side of history and also by cooperating for the struggle of freedom. The struggle of freedom cannot be uh, divided. It's all one struggle. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Dr. El Arian and uh, Professor Chak. Uh, you can take it from here. Thank you very much, Ramzi, and thank you very much, Professor Sami, for that fantastic overview of the situation. You know, I want to take a moment here and quote you, Thomas Hobbes, Professor Sami. Men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief in keeping company where there is no power to overawe them all. But Considering that a major impediment towards Palestinian solidarity has been a rift between Hamas and Fatah, what could have resolved that rift? What lessons can be learned that Kashmiris could learn in that regard? Uh, a thorny question. It deserves an answer. Uh, certainly one of the setbacks of the Palestinian struggle, uh, particularly after the Oslo Accords, have been when the enemy, when the, your foe was able to penetrate uh, within the struggle and try to uh, uh, present something that is alluring to part of the population in order to divide it so that they cannot be, they will, they will not have the same uh, power of resistance that they used to have. Palestinians were always united in terms of what the end goal is. And the end goal has always been to restore Palestinian freedom and rights and to end the brutal occupation and to dismantle the instruments of this occupation. However, after 1993, there was another attack because some people either they felt tired or they thought, you know, that they could get something without understanding the history of the struggle. And it has been an illusion. And I think there is no uh, reason for these people to continue on that path a destructive path, I might add, that ended with what's called the steel of the century. You know, what, what Trump and Netanyahu are trying to uh, 
uh, to present to the Palestinians, basically to end the Palestinian uh, struggle. So what we need here, the, the lessons to be learned here is that you never handed your freedom on a silver platter. What you have to do is to unite the people and you, by uniting them that they have to have one goal and that goal must be to confront this challenge, this occupation, this uh, uh, ideology, all as one people and we cannot be divided and we cannot be taken advantage of and don't ever trust others because weakness and without having really uh, the means to struggle and the, 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 the best thing is to, is, to, is, to, is to defy that occupation and to stand up for your rights. So we need unity of purpose. That unity of purpose was lost in the Palestinians in 93. Thank God we had part of the Palestinian people who were never, uh, uh, they never bought this illusion. They were never allured. And of course you have the neighborhood and that's part of the problem. You know, the neighborhood here has been cold for, for the most part. And they have they have been putting as enough pressure on them as also the the, the occupation itself. So you need the United Front. You need to have unity of, of of purpose. You could have division of labor. That's acceptable because you have different means. But they have to be going to the same path, not onto a an, completely separate path or contradicting uh, path. You need also strong leadership. If you have uh, uh, weak leadership, it demoralizes the people. So one huge lesson that we must have is you always bring people who are morally clear, ethically clear, and principally clear about the goal and that they use these ethical moral standards, but they're also strong in uniting the, their people and leading them to where they need to be. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor Sami. Uh, Brother Ramsey? Yes, my question is to uh, His Excellency. Um, the relationship between Israel and India is has never been stronger as it is today. I mean, the 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 Israel is uh, uh, one of the uh, biggest trade partners of India, and it goes beyond money and beyond economy and technology and 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 so forth to the fact that ideologically there is some you know great deal of similarities and overlappings to the point that it was reported that President Modi had a picture of Ariel Sharon in his office because he considered him a model uh, and uh, someone uh, to, um, that he respected a great deal. Now, do you feel that considering that this is the case and the similarities that we've already discussed between Kashmir and Palestine and, and their joint struggle, do you feel that the Palestinian leadership has done enough to address this imbalance? Have the Palestinian leadership reached out to you or tried to kind of correct that imbalance politically by reaching out and trying to find ways to create true political solidarity between both nations. Well, let me tell you that uh, there's a strong bond between Pakistan and Palestine and uh, there's strong solidarity between the people of Jammu and Kashmir and Palestine. Uh, people have given lives here, as it was pointed out by Professor al Arian, for Palestine. Uh, I was ambassador in Geneva, uh, the United Nations, uh, and uh, in New York. And in both places, I personally championed the cause of Palestine, meeting after meeting, and we had many resolutions passed. As a matter of fact, people could not distinguish whether um, we were Palestinians or Pakistanis. I mean, so, 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 so uh, strong was our passion for Palestine. So. I have given, I mean, I can give you this testimony that I have given a big chunk of my life, my diplomatic life, to Palestine. So, uh, there is this solidarity, this understanding. Uh, we are brothers and sisters. In fact, I can tell you that uh, when we used to sit in the different committees or the plenaries of the United Nations or other international forums, we would sit as brothers and sisters, as if we were members of the same delegation. So, uh, for us, Palestine is Kashmir. Uh, even uh, as a standalone issue, it is so close to our heart. And uh, we know the kind of violation of rights that has taken place in that territory. Let me uh, highlight something. Uh, 
because I think that the, we use this word existential threat quite often. But I think that uh, Palestine and Kashmir are facing literally existential threat, which means that they might be wiped off the face of the world uh, as entities, as populations, as cultures. And this is happening uh, before our eyes because the kind of changes that they're making in Kashmir and Palestine um, in due course, there would be no Palestine or there would be no Kashmir, which can be recognized as separate entities. So th then they would say game over because there is no Palestine there. Uh, these, are the, the, I mean, these are Jewish settlers there or in Kashmir, for instance, I mean, um, Indians have done it in a uh, much cruder fashion because they are importing people with, at fast speed and settling them there. So there would be no Kashmir which would be recognized or recognizable as Kashmir. Now, <clears throat> what should we do as a matter of fact? Uh, I would say that uh, we should not talk about uh, our differences but our commonalities and uh, we should strive towards uh, increasing our friends and decreasing uh, the number of our adversaries and enemies. Let me tell you that in the aftermath of the steps that were taken by India on August the 5th last year, there was a groundswell of support for Kashmir and the rights of the Kashmiris in the Western world also. In the United Kingdom, in Europe, in North America, there are parliaments, there are civil society organizations, and this was not prompted or prodded by Pakistan or the Kashmiris. Uh, they did so of their own volition. Now, <clears throat> so we have to make a coalition, not just within the Muslim world, but uh, across the um, continents and across the um, religious and political spectrum. This is one thing. Another thing is that um, a, India is also killing, lynching, and discriminating against Muslims. They have designated Muslims as outsiders, as foreigners, as intruders, as infiltrators. And uh, uh, they are subjecting them to inhuman and degrading treatment every day. So, uh, in fact, I mean, you would recall that this, um, uh, some 650 members of the European Parliament in March had said, that uh, what India is doing to Muslims or to Christians or to other minorities that would create uh, the biggest precedent of statelessness in the history of mankind because all these people would be displaced or there would be there would be a program and they would be asked to leave that place. Now, <clears throat> India has conflated Kashmir with Indian Muslims and what they do, they tell these lies uh, and they sort of uh, practice this jingoism in order to consolidate their uh, electoral base. Because the more hatred there is against the Muslims, the more support there is for these fascist parties. So I agree with Professor Al Aryan that there is this uh, striking similarity between um, Zionism and Hindutva. I should not be because uh, these uh, Zionists or Jews, uh, they are monotheistic and Hinduism is polytheistic. But you know that it is not about religion, it is about power, it is about uh, uh, supremacist philosophy or doctrine. Now, <clears throat> I think that uh, Professor Lan Aryan also talked about empowering these movements. And I think that empowering movements, this should, this should not be islands which should be empowered. This should be the entire community that we are talking about. And two things are essential, as everybody knows. One is we should have faith in our destiny and that we can reshape it. And the second is that we should have strong economies because, uh, because of the weak economies, uh, I'm talking about the Muslim countries in general, they become dependent on other countries and they follow their diktat. So, <clears throat> uh, I have already answered your question and 
added a few thoughts to that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. So thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, and uh, I think now, uh, Professor Ramsey, uh, we're going to move into questions from the audience. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, maybe you can figure out the, the, the Q&A uh, section better than me. Uh, what do you see in front of you? Sure, actually, I just went over some of the questions asked, and one was particularly important, but one of the, and I would pose this question to both our esteemed, uh, you know, uh, guests. But one of the participants mentioned the of something that in Kashmiri is referred to as the collaborators, and they have often taken the role, whether in civil society, and especially in regards to Kashmir, the Jammu and Kashmir police force that is absolutely abhorred for its role in, in working with the occupation. Now, there is a similar dynamic happening in esteem, a similar dynamic, especially in regards to, unfortunately, the crime. So, my panelists would be how, and this is what Abdullah was, was asking, how should one respond to these people within the each respective community? So, how would the Palestinians respond to this? How would the Kashmiris respond? Or should they respond to such type of internal collaboration? And I think we'll start with Professor Sami. Professor Sami, what yes. do you think? Uh, thank you for this question. It's an excellent question. And the Palestinian uh, community had uh, throughout had to deal with this uh, for, for a century. Uh, I am totally against any kind of violence against these people because violence begets violence and then the whole point is actually lost and I think it's counterproductive. But I think what we need is, is education, massive education and also uh, isolation. These people have to be exposed, they have to be isolated, they have to be shamed. Uh, once that is done, that is going to, for the most part, uh, uh, curtail this, this phenomena. But it's a very dangerous phenomena. Uh, Palestinian, the Palestinian struggle had to uh, to endure and to face this for a long time, and it was very difficult. Uh, in Gaza, for instance, today <clears throat> that number was in the thousands. Today it's probably just in in the in the in the tens. The, and the one reason uh, because they were dealt with in a way that they were shown their 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 incorrect ways, and they were dealt with again through massive education as well as uh, social pressure on them as well as uh, trying to identify them and try to reason with them. And if not, obviously, you, uh, they, they would be imprisoned and things like that. But the bottom line is, I think we, we do not need to have to start a, uh, a civil or strife within the communities. This phenomena, the enemy will always try to penetrate, to try to bribe, to try to ex uh, extort, uh, to, to manipulate. They will use all kinds of tactics because they're trying to uh, change the nature of the conflict from a conflict between, uh, for justice and freedom into a conflict where the, the victims themselves will start fighting each other and they will just be looking from the outside. And I think this is, this is what we need to realize and we need to deal with it in a very uh, uh, compassionate but also firm way. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Sami, for that response. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, President Masood Khan, so, you know, in, Kash in Kashmir, we had to deal with, they've had to deal with several generations of collaborators. And um, uh, this class of collaborators started with uh, one of our most popular leaders at that time, Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, and uh, his descendants, they have collaborated with the Indian government. And uh, there is another dynasty there. So this uh, uh, collaboration has become uh, dynastic. Uh, they are the facilitators of Indian occupation and they are a different class altogether. You know, uh, it is because of them that they legitimize their occupation and their draconian measures. Uh, 
when they took uh, these uh, very extraordinary steps last year in August, they imprisoned everybody, not only these pro-freedom leaders, but also their own collaborators and put them under lock and key. Of course, since then they have um, released Farooq Abdullah and his son Umar Abdullah, uh, and they too are responsible for the uh, brutalization of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, uh, under uh, Mahbuba Mufti's watch, uh, more than 1,500 uh, people of Kashmir were blinded. This is uh, probably unprecedented mass blinding in the history of mankind. So these people are collaborators. Now, what when India moved into Kashmir, I mean, last year when it invaded the territory, reoccupied it, uh, put it under siege, they realized that uh, neither their previous loyalists uh, nor some of their lackeys would be able to uh, get the consent of the people because all the decisions last year were taken without the consent, without a shed of uh, consent of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So now what they're busy doing is that they are creating a new political class. Uh, it's not just the police it's, uh, or the people who are serving the government because uh, they, they do raise uh, this force there and they, there's this pretense that uh, they create that uh, the Jammu and Kashmir of India. But I'm talking about this new political class which is being created through bribes and through different sorts of incentives. And now they would use them to tyrannize the people of Jammu and Kashmir, and they would say that this is Kashmiri killing Kashmiri, it is not Indians, and they would not like to soil their hands. Uh, we know this. This is what the colonialists used to do. Uh, this is what the imperial powers did. And uh, right now, I can tell with 100% certainty that uh, Kashmir is under colonial rule, alien domination, and foreign occupation. So is Palestine. Palestine, we call it occupied Palestinian territory. So uh, let's uh, have no um, uh, conceptual ambiguity. And uh, let's move forward. Uh, right now, the biggest challenge we are facing is to maintain our faith. Because India is uh, trying to give this impression, and so is Israel, and so is Washington, that it's game over that n nothing can happen, that a new order has been um, launched. And, you know, uh, the crafters of the uh, um, uh, annexation of the West Bank had the temerity to call their plans uh, a peace plan, um, uh, the, the best ever. So, uh, although it was an occupation plan. So, I think that uh, we are awake to the situation and uh, we would continue to resist, uh, resist. And let me reiterate the resolve of the Kashmiris that no matter what happens, we are not going to accept the legitimacy of Indian occupiers or their facilitators. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Fantastic. And absolutely. And I can say with certainty that neither the Palestinians nor the Kashmiris are going to go quietly about this. They will not accept the occupation of their lands. Um, I wanted to touch briefly before I take another question uh, on the idea of shaming the collaborator. Uh, Professor Ramsey, what are your thoughts on that? Like, this is something that Professor Sami touched on, and maybe you can explore this a little bit and add into the conversation about the shaming. Right. So um, I um, listened to what uh, Professor Alarian uh, said about this, and, and as someone who was born and raised in Gaza, I kind of went through this process of kind of witnessing how collaborators were dealt with. And, and of course, there is absolutely no moral uh, or ethical justification of collaborating with the enemy whatsoever. But it's also important that we realize that many of these collaborators, they come from extremely poor backgrounds or people who have uh, experienced abuse and, and are dealing with fear uh, of their own and they are desperate to survive as well. And I think the, 
the method of, of, of re-educating and reaching out and providing, you know, what they call uh, the in Arabic, the tawbah or forgiveness by allowing people to come in front of the public and say, my name is such and such, I collaborated and I seek your forgiveness. And people would actually hug them and, and kiss them and, and then and normalize their relationship with society again, as opposed to simply just murder them, which creates more strife and more violence and so forth. If I, I could just, um, I know we are running short on time, if I could ask our distinguished speakers uh, one question, um, uh, you know, very quick question. Uh, say that I am a, uh, a Kashmiri or a Palestinian uh, student, uh, intellectual, or just a, an ordinary person who cares deeply about both nations and, and would love to translate the word solidarity into something meaningful. So if we can lower the ceiling just a little bit, and you know, here I am listening to, to our speakers, what do I do with solidarity? How do I exhibit solidarity in a way that actually takes us forward and help both nations in their struggle against colonialism and military occupation? Uh, Dr. Al Aryan, if you don't mind. Very well, I think it's a, it's a very important and, and pointed question uh, because we can talk endlessly about the struggle, but unless there is some kind of an action to compel and pressure the enemy to uh, to to change their tactics and to 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 open up the uh, the, uh, the the societies that they are occupying. And I would say uh, very simply, we need to start coordinating. Uh, there is very strong BDS movement among uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, movement as well as worldwide. Uh, I think that needs to be embraced uh, to go beyond Israel, but also to uh, to 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 encompass the the Kashmiri issue. I think BDS for Kashmir also could be very, uh, very important uh, uh, tactic. Uh, uh, there are millions and millions of, 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 Indian, of Indians uh, living in Muslim societies across the Muslim world, particularly in the Gulf, where they remit billions upon maybe tens of billions of dollars to, to the Indian economy. And I think that's a huge pressure tactic where people could actually use that as leverage in order to change the situation in Kashmir. I realize that these are small steps, but these you know, over time will accumulate. Uh, we can uh, study the struggle of apartheid South Africa, how that struggle started in the 50s and continued to progress until eventually it, it reached uh, mass movement and critical point in the late 80s where it, it uh, the whole system crumbled. And that's how we're going to approach this. You know, both struggles, as I said, are very similar and we could use and learn from each other's struggle. And I think what we need to do also is to make sure that we support that the people inside are the first line of defense. We cannot allow them to be demoralized. We need to support the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza under siege and occupation. We need to support the people in Kashmir there. There are millions of Kashmiris around the world. This is a huge point that must be utilized. These people could be actually the bridges with these societies that have been enabling this occupation and enabling the continuation of this suffering of the people of Kashmir and Palestine. These people need to be mobilized and we can mobilize in, 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 in many ways. Just imagine if we can put the resources available to the Palestinian Solidarity Co Committee, not only among Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims, but worldwide. You know, the Palestinian situation today is a worldwide <coughs> Uh, solidarity movement. We can also do the same for Kashmir because they are, they are so similar and the suffering is there. And I think you'll find a lot of people willing to do that, especially with some racist, blatantly and openly racist administration taking over today in, in, in Kashmir and, uh, and in India itself. So there's a lot to be done here. Uh, you know, I don't have time to go over the, the specifics, but you could see where I'm going with this, that there are many tactics, but we need to start organizing, mobilizing and and uniting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. El Arian, Your Excellency, and perhaps uh, a final remark as well. Well, I, 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 I really have a remark yet, by the way. <laughs> yes, I, I have one more in it. <laughs> I'll have, uh, I'll be very brief. Well, yes, seminars like these reinforce solidarity. So if we have more seminars in universities, in um, colleges, in, in think tanks, that would help. Second is that, yes, um, the BDS movement uh, should encompass the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, as Professor al has said. We should use communications, communications to the multilateral forums and to the world leadership. 
leaders of the powerful countries. Um, we should send them as many communications as possible. Communications includes, of course, the use of social media, the new media, and the new technologies that are emerging. I'm not talking about the media that we have right now, but the media that is emerging. Uh, diplomacy has hit a snag. You know, the uh, Palestinians, have, have they have a, an observer status in the United Nations, but it hasn't helped. The whole of the European Union supports Palestinians, but that doesn't help. Uh, so they're blocked, their pathways are blocked in uh, Washington or New York or uh, other forums. So something beyond diplomacy is necessary. And uh, that is outreach to civil society all around the world. I mean, of course, we have our own civil society, but civil society in Europe and uh, in North America, in the Asia Pacific region, in the whole of Middle East, that would help. Uh, because, you know, um, uh, apartheid was abolished partly because of this worldwide civil society campaign. Or the, the United States of America was defeated in Vietnam, um, not because of the military victory of the uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese people, but because of the international movement that supported their effort. So I think that we should invest in uh, those kinds of movements, civil society movements. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I believe now we have, um, we are running out of time and we have one minute uh, for final remarks by uh, both of our distinguished uh, speakers. So we will start with Professor Al Aryan. Again, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, Dr. Shaq and Dr. Ramsey, for this lively discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I hope, inshallah, that something good can, can come out of it. Uh, people should not live under occupation. In this day and age, people must live in freedom. This master-slave relationship must end and must never be acceptable to anybody. Uh, the struggle in Kashmir and Palestine is not a religious struggle even though religion is part of this. It is a geopolitical pressure, it's a, it's a geopolitical struggle, and it's a political struggle, and therefore everybody should embrace the struggle for freedom. Our struggle is one, our destiny, our destiny is one, our goal is one, and that is we need to restore freedom, justice, and self-determination to the people of Kashmir, and the people of Palestine. When people talk about peace and stability, there is without justice, there is no peace. Without justice, there is no stability without justice. Our slogan should be, from Kashmir to Palestine, occupation is a crime. From Kashmir to Palestine, occupation is a crime. That means everybody's business is to make sure that this crime is no longer in the books, is no longer the life or the life of people in Kashmir and Palestine. Freedom, justice, and self-determination to the people of Kashmir and Palestine. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alarian. Beautifully uh, worded uh, your final remarks, Your Excellency. Very briefly, we will not surrender. We will not capitulate. We will forge ahead and we would attain self-determination and justice for the people of Kashmir and for the people of Palestine. Thank you. Inshallah, and thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, my uh, distinguished colleague, uh, Professor Chak, if you uh, could have the final word, please. Thank you very much. Just to say, repeat what everyone has said, I really appreciate it. This, this is just the start. You know, Professor Ramsey, Brother Ramsey, Professor Sami, Your Excellency, let's work on this more wholeheartedly and comprehensively. And inshallah, this is just the start of this unity between our peoples that has always been there and that some people might try to provide. But nonetheless, we are, as you, Excellency, not going to surrender, not going to give up. And from Palestine to Kashmir, occupation is a crime. Let's get that tweeted on every platform, uh, Professor Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to our viewers and, and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Ramzi Khai.
Bye-bye.